Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Allison Kate, and I'm a hand and upper extremity surgeon with Summit Orthopedics and Sibley Memorial Hospital. I'd like to thank the Gildehorn Institute for giving us the opportunity to talk with you today about some of the common conditions that we treat as hand surgeons, uh, specifically, why do our hands hurt? So the first condition that I'm gonna talk about today is carpal tunnel syndrome. And carpal tunnel syndrome is one of the most common conditions that I see as a hand surgeon. Patients typically describe burning type pain in their hands with associated numbness and tingling. And the classic scenario is it's often first noticed at night and it wakes patients up at night and they have to shake their hand out to make the pins and needles and the numbness and tingling and the pain go away. Often the pain won't just be in the hand, but it travels all the way up the arm. And if the symptoms progress, in addition to nighttime symptoms, they can also get daytime symptoms where they feel like their fingers fall asleep while driving or talking on the phone. And sometimes it gets bad enough that patients also notice lot, last, lock, lack of sensation at baseline and, and they drop objects. So they have some weakness in their hand. This is a picture here on the left-hand side of what the carpal tunnel nerve does. And essentially it provides sensation to the palmar surface of the thumb, the index finger, the middle finger, and the half of the ring finger closest to the thumb. It does not provide sensation on the back of the hand. And the carpal tunnel nerve also gives strength to the base of the thumb, which is why this is shaded in here. On the right-hand side of your screen, you can see an MRI showing a cross-sectional view of the carpal tunnel space itself. And on this picture where my arrow is here at the bottom of the screen is the palm, and the back of the hand is up here at the top of the screen just to orient you. These structures where my arrow is are all the bones of the wrist, the small bones of the wrist. And the carpal tunnel is right here. I'm outlining it right here. And what you can see is where the red arrow is pointing to is the median nerve, which is this white structure right where my arrow is. And that median nerve is what gets pinched in carpal tunnel syndrome. And the median nerve is what gives sensation to this thumb, index, middle, and half the ring finger. In the carpal tunnel, along with the median nerve, are all these dark gray ovals, which are the tendons that help you grip your steering wheel, type with, hold power tools with, and carry heavy things with, the flexor tendons. And we talked about the bones of the wrist being the floor of the carpal tunnel, but the roof of the carpal tunnel is this dark band right here where my white arrow is. And that is called the transverse carpal ligament. And the transverse carpal ligament is a really taut structure that does not expand under pressure. So when the nerve gets pinched because of swelling around those tendons, um, or fluid retention states such as pregnancy um, or arthritis, you get pins and needles and numbness and tingling in this distribution with the thumb, index, middle, and half the ring finger. And like I said, initially, it's typically a come and go thing where you shake your hand out and it goes away. It tends to happen most at night because we tend to sleep with our wrists bent like this. And when you put your wrist in a bent position or an extended position, the pressures in that carpal tunnel space go up. And so the nerve gets pinched more frequently. But over time, if the nerve gets pinched again and again and again, the symptoms go from being a come and go thing where you shake your hand out to numbness all the time where you have hard time feeling objects doing buttons, for example. And that happens when the nerve gets damaged from being pinched again and again. And if it keeps progressing, you end up with damage to these muscles over here, which are the thenar muscles. And this is a picture of somebody's hand with severe untreated carpal tunnel syndrome. And you can see that the muscle at the base of the thumb here has atrophy. So instead of having a convex appearance at the base of the thumb, it's concave because of severe carpal tunnel with loss of that muscle. There is a lot we can do as hand surgeons for carpal tunnel treatment. And the most conservative approach and the earliest approach for carpal tunnel is to wear a wrist brace at night. And so when the symptoms are mild and patients only have nighttime symptoms without daytime symptoms, we classically start with giving them a wrist brace to keep their wrist in a neutral position at night. Keeping in mind that a wrist that is in neutral is less likely to have those pressures go up in the carpal tunnel. 
And if this works and they never wake up with pins and needles in their hand, we stay the course. But ultimately, this typically does progress over time. And if it progresses to the point that they get daytime symptoms with pins and needles during the day and numbness and tingling during the day, like for example, driving or talking on the phone, that's when we consider a carpal tunnel injection. And the carpal tunnel injection is an office procedure that we do uh, in the office with no anesthesia. It's a tiny little poke and it classically gets rid of the pins and needles and the pain very quickly if the source of the pain is in fact carpal tunnel. And in my hands, the injection is very helpful for a couple things. Number one, it helps uh, diagnose carpal tunnel because there's other reasons why your hands can be uh, numb and tingly. And sometimes there's confounding issues where you have a pinch nerve in your neck and a pinch nerve in the carpal tunnel and together uh, they combine to cause uh, the symptoms. But if we inject the carpal tunnel and the symptoms improve, the part that improves is the part that was due to the carpal tunnel itself. Injections for carpal tunnel are very effective for taking care of symptoms uh, in a large percentage of patients. But 85% of patients get recurrence of symptoms within a year. And if and when the problem recurs, the next step would be the definitive treatment for carpal tunnel, which is to open the roof of that carpal tunnel, that transverse carpal ligament that I showed you on the MRI. And this is a schematic view of that. So essentially, the definitive treatment for carpal tunnel is to open this roof so that the contents of that carpal tunnel are no longer under pressure. And classically, with this minor surgical procedure, the nighttime wakening and the having to shake the hand out goes away the night of surgery. And I hopefully it will never come back. In the vast majority of patients, it never comes back. If we get to carpal tunnel syndrome and we treat it when it's still in the come and go phase without numbness all the time, but the pins and needles that come and go, we can very characteristically and very uh, predictably give our patients very good relief without uh, ongoing issues. But a tricky thing happens when we get patients who have been treated for carpal tunnel uh, for a very long time, um, and they already have numbness all the time in addition to come and go pins and needles and pain. And in those patients, I have a hard conversation with them because they often have friends who say, oh, carpal tunnel surgery didn't work for me. Uh, and essentially that often comes down to a communication issue and understanding what the goals of treatment are when we get to a late stage disease. So essentially what happens is this, if the fingers are numb all the time and you have weakness at the base of your thumb, the carpal tunnel is very severe. If you're still waking up, having to shake your hand out, that means the nerve is still getting damaged and still having progressive problems. And so in those instances, patients often benefit from carpal tunnel release surgery to improve the symptoms, to stop the nighttime wakening and to stop the pain and the pins and needles. But the numbness that's there all the time from the nerve having been damaged from being squished for so long and the weakness may or may not recover over time. By doing the surgery and opening this roof and giving the nerve space to breathe, the nerve may in fact recover and nerves can recover, nerves can regenerate. They can heal about a millimeter a day. So I tell patients from about here down to the tips of the fingers, it can be a few months after carpal tunnel surgery to find out whether they're gonna regain sensation if they have lost it. In general, if you've had symptoms for less than three years and you're younger in age, the chance of you recovering nerve damage from ongoing untreated carpal tunnel is much higher than if you're older in age and it's been going on for a very, very long time. But I never say never because I've seen um, elderly patients with very long-standing symptoms get improvement over time. So, um, Certainly at the very least, I tell patients we're, we're doing the surgery to prevent it from getting worse. The surgery procedure itself is done in a couple ways. Uh, the way that I classically do it is with a tiny incision in the palm that's a little less than two centimeters, and that's called a mini open carpal tunnel release. I do it this way because I like to see exactly what I'm cutting when I release the carpal tunnel ligament. And the surgery is done either completely awake with just local anesthetic, or with twilight anesthesia, where you just take a quick nap and you wake up and you're done. Uh, and I just put a little bit of numbing medicine in your palm. But the surgery takes about 20 minutes and then you go home with a soft bandage on your hand. 
The bandage is on for four days. And then after that, you can get your hand wet in the shower and do light stuff with your hand, like typing and writing, but no heavy lifting or gripping. Usually that nighttime wakening goes away the night of surgery. And as I said, if we rest properly and let that roof of the carpal tunnel heal back in in a more stretched out position, ideally the symptoms go away and never come back. And that's the, the scenario for the vast majority of my patients. So in summary, carpal tunnel is a source of pain in the hand that we see a lot. It's always with pins and needles or numbness and tingling. And so if you don't have pins and needles or numbness and tingling, it's very unlikely that you have carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, and it is very, very treatable, but the key take home point there is it's better to treat it earlier rather than later, because if we wait too long till the nerve is damaged, there is less predictability as to the outcomes. I'm going to move on to uh, my next condition, um, but I just wanna make a quick comment that if you do have questions, please put them in the chat and I'm going to get to as many as I possibly can at the end of um, the lecture. All right, there are other reasons, like I mentioned, for numbness and tingling in the hand. And another one um, that I see a lot is called cubital tunnel syndrome. And unlike carpal tunnel syndrome, where it's the thumb, index, and middle finger and half of the ring finger, cubital tunnel syndrome causes numbness and tingling in the pinky and the other half of the ring finger, as well as some weakness in the hand. It also causes nighttime wakening. And as I said, the area of numbness is on the outside of the hand here. When cubital tunnel syndrome progresses, it causes a lot of atrophy in the rest of the hand, not just the base of the thumb, like the median nerve for carpal tunnel, this nerve does the intrinsic strength of the hand. And so if you look at this patient's hands here, her left hand has a lot of strength and normal uh, appearance of the muscles in the hand. And the right hand, you can see the bony prominences and the tendons very well because there's a lot of atrophy of the muscle of the intrinsic muscles of the hand, which the ulnar nerve typically innervates. The cubital tunnel syndrome occurs when the ulnar nerve gets pinched at the elbow classically. And this is a side view, a schematic view of the elbow showing this big bony bump right here, which is called the medial epicondyle. And we, in layman's terms, think of this as the funny bone. And so the ulnar nerve runs around the outside of the funny bone. And so when you bend your elbow, which again, classically we sleep like this with our elbow bent, that nerve can get tractioned around the bony bump. And when the nerve is tractioned, you get pins and needles in these two fingers on the outside of your hand. You shake your elbow out, you straighten your arm out and the symptoms go away. But just like carpal tunnel syndrome, it can progress to the point that it goes from come and go pins and needles and pain to, to numb all the time and weakness. And ideally we get to it before that happens. Treatment for cubital tunnel starts with a nighttime brace to prevent you from bending your elbow up at night when you're sleeping. And this is an example of one you can get over the counter on Amazon or at the drugstores. And essentially the idea is to kind of stent your elbow open so you can't hyperflex it at night. I also often recommend taking a sweatshirt or something soft that's more comfortable to sleep with and putting it in the center part of your elbow as a barrier for flexion and using the arms of the sweatshirt to loosely tie on the outside of your elbow because that can be a little bit more comfortable than the more rigid splints. In addition, sometimes we recommend some Voltaren gel, which is like topical Advil that you can rub right on the inside of the elbow here to take away the inflammation around the nerve. But if symptoms progress despite this, sometimes we do need to release the ulnar nerve. When you have symptoms like this, your surgeon may recommend getting a nerve test or an ultrasound study to verify the diagnosis. And those are sometimes done for carpal tunnel and cubital tunnel to make sure that the site of nerve compression is accurate from the clinical picture. But typically, as I said, with the ulnar nerve, it's typically at the elbow. And if we do need to intervene as a surgical uh, solution, we do a small incision on the inside of the elbow and we release the nerve at several spots of compression along the inside of the elbow where it is classically compressed. And those are shown in this diagram here. And then after we free the nerve, your surgeon may or may not move the nerve in front of the bony bump. So it no longer has traction when you bend your elbow. And for me, I classically assess the nerve at the time of surgery and I see if it needs to be moved or not on a case-by-case -case basis. 
All right, moving on to another source of hand pain, I'm going to talk a little bit about trigger finger. And this is another really common condition that I see that causes a lot of hand pain. In this uh, picture, you can see that the person has their thumb right at the base of their finger. And that's typically where the finger hurts with trigger finger. And it often hurts when we grip um, and close our, our fist and try to grab things. When uh, this condition worsens, you also can get catching or clicking of the finger, and sometimes it can get completely stuck in a bent position. And classically, it typically gets stuck in the morning when you first wake up, uh, because classically we try to sleep with our fingers in a fist, and I'll explain that in just a moment. It can be very painful when it sticks, and sometimes it's not that painful, it's just gonna be very annoying. So it depends on uh, the specific presentation as to whether it's painful or just an annoyance. This is a side view of a finger here on the left side of your screen. And the white structures here are the bones of the finger. And this dark gray structure is a representation of the tendon that helps you bend a fit and make a fist and bend your finger. The tendon is held close to the bones by these light gray structures called pulleys. And I like you to think of the pulleys like the loops on your pants that hold your belt in place. These pulleys hold the tendon in place to the bone so it doesn't bowstring away when you make a fist. When you have a trigger finger, the pulley at the base of your finger called the A1 pulley, which I'm circling right here, gets thickened and inflamed just from use. And then as you bend and straighten your finger again and again, the friction of the tendon passing underneath this inflamed pulley causes the tendon to form a reactive thickening or a nodule. So back to our belt analogy, now it's like your belt has a knot in it. And when you bend and straighten, you're pulling that knot underneath that frayed and inflamed belt loop. And when the knot gets big enough, the finger can get stuck in that bent position. You have to kind of force it through. But even when it doesn't get stuck, just by virtue of having that knot pull underneath the tendon can cause pain, swelling, and inflammation throughout the finger. There is a lot we can do for trigger finger. And the most conservative treatment option is to give patients a brace to wear at night to prevent you from flexing your finger too tight at night and engaging that knot. And I classically mix that with some anti-inflammatory cream, such as the Voltaren gel I mentioned earlier. And there's also some prescription stronger versions of it that you can rub right over the spot to take away the pain and inflammation. In very mild cases, this can be effective, but if this worsens and progresses, we move on to the next steps in treatment. I do not like patients to wear a splint during the day because the biggest problem with trigger fingers that are left untreated is the stiffness in the finger that happens when we don't treat it. And patients restrict their motion because it hurts. And so then they end up with stiffness at the joints that's harder to overcome. So I do a brace at night only, but not during the day. And if the finger's catching on patients during the day or causing pain, usually I progress to a cortisone injection. And unlike cortisone injections, for many of the different conditions we treat in orthopedics, for example, arthritis, Cortisone for a trigger finger can be curative. So it's temporizing type measure in a lot of things we do in orthopedics, but for trigger finger, it can be curative. So one cortisone injection for trigger finger has about a 50% chance of solving the problem and it will never come back. And so um, most patients choose to try that. Um, if the problem goes away for some time and comes back, we can consider a second injection but the success rates of a second injection are lower than the 50% for the first injection. But if the problem recurs after two injections, I don't recommend further cortisone because too much cortisone around the tendons is not good for the soft tissues. And so if the problem comes back after two injections, we typically proceed with definitive treatment for trigger finger, which is a surgical release. And this is a picture of one person's uh, type of incision for a trigger release. I actually don't do this incision. I tend to put it in the creases in the palm to make it look a little prettier. Uh, but essentially the trigger finger surgery is a pretty easy surgery for patients to get through. We numb up the skin where the incision is going to be. And we make a small incision over that pulley that's thickened and inflamed. And we just open the pulley. So now the tendon can pass without that knot getting stuck on a belt loop. 
the A1 pulley, the belt loop that we release, the belt loop that's implicated in trigger finger is the least functionally important belt loop. And so I tell people, your pants are still gonna stay up. So there's no functional deficit with a trigger finger release. People do very, very well afterwards, but the pain goes away. Similar to carpal tunnel, at least in my hands, this surgery has two anesthesia options, the completely awake one or the twilight anesthesia. And if you're completely awake with these types of surgeries, you can eat and drink and drive yourself home the day of surgery. You don't need any anesthesia. You don't need any medical clearance. There's no IV. There's no blood work. Nobody checking an EKG. We take you to the procedure suite of our surgical center and we put a little bit of numbing medicine in your palm. And that does sting for a few seconds, similar to kind of a dental procedure, um, but only a few seconds. And then during the surgery, you have no pain. There's a drape up. So a lot of people don't like the idea of seeing surgery, but everything's done sterilely and there's a drape up. So you don't see surgery. You may feel a little pressure as we release the trigger, but you don't feel pain. And then once we open the pulley, it can be very gratifying to have patients participate in the surgery and squeeze and open their fingers to make sure that they're smooth gliding with no catching or locking anymore. Similar to carpal tunnel, you're just in a soft bandage for a few days and then using your hand for light activity very quickly, like typing and writing. So for example, I typically operate on Thursdays and I tell patients that on the Monday after surgery, the fourth day, their bandage comes off, they can get their hand wet in the shower and they can do light activity like typing and writing as long as it doesn't hurt them. About two weeks after surgery, the stitches come out and then patients go back to full activity with no limitations. So that is trigger finger. The other option for anesthesia is the twilight anesthesia. And if you do it with a twilight, you don't feel the pinch and the sting of the numbing medicine going in. You take a quick nap, trigger finger surgery is done, and you have the same recovery. You just don't feel or participate anything in the surgery because you're taking a nap. And in those cases, you need somebody over the age of 18 to take you home. Uh, you cannot eat or drink the morning of surgery and you need an IV place to give you the medicine to make you feel comfortable, similar to like a colonoscopy with twilight anesthesia. Okay, so that's trigger finger. We are gonna move on to base of thumb arthritis. <clears throat> so this is one of the other most common conditions that I see in my office. And essentially base of thumb arthritis causes pain right in this area down here. And classically people feel um, pain when they pinch and they write and they try to pull the lid off of a yogurt or turn a key and they have weakness and pain with things like opening water bottles or jars. And it's often on both hands, uh, but sometimes one side's worse than the, than the other side because of either uh, an old history of trauma um, or, or just more, more use on that side. Um, so this uh, picture on the right-hand side is showing you exactly what's going on with the base of thumb arthritis. So um, this picture here is sort of reversed from this side. So this is the thumb metacarpal, which sits right about here. And these are the wrist bones right here. And so if you look where my arrow is pointing here, you can see that there is a nice dark space that's pretty symmetric and well-preserved where my arrow is. And that dark space on the x-ray represents the cartilage that is there between those two bones. And the cartilage, that smooth white cap on the end of the chicken bone is what allows bones to articulate at a joint without grinding and without pain. We don't see cartilage on x-ray, but if we see the space occupied by the cartilage, we know that the cartilage is still there. If you look on this picture, one joint closer to the thumb, you can see that that dark space there is now gone. And in addition to loss of the joint space, so the cartilage is gone, you can see that it looks very white and the bone looks whiter here than it looks here. And that's because this bone is seeing so much more stress because the shock absorber from the cartilage is gone. And so it's seeing a lot of stress from that bone grinding on bone. And then the other feature you can see here is this huge bone spur that has formed as this bone has popped outward, um, which is why a lot of times people look like they have a big prominence at the base of their thumb when they have arthritis here, uh, because this starts moving outward and it's often because of a bone spur and because of some weakness of the ligaments here. So when this happens, you get the constellation of symptoms I've described with pain and weakness. 
And just like everything we've discussed today, there's a lot of things that we as hand surgeons can do to help with this condition. Similar to what we've discussed, the most conservative approach for uh, this condition is to give you a brace. And this is an example of one that the hand therapist can make out of uh, plastic to kind of custom mold something to give you some support. So there's less bone grinding on bone there. Um, and there's also prefabricated ones that we have in the office that patients can try on. And you can also look for one over the counter um, to find one that fits you right. But by supporting the thumb, it tends to hurt less when you use it. And that's the most conservative approach. And often we combine that with the Voltaren gel or the prescription strength gel that I talked about earlier, which is a little topical cream to put there to get rid of the pain from the arthritis. As symptoms progress, cortisone injections are another valuable, helpful tool for treating basic thumb arthritis. And I tell people that the cortisone does not cure the arthritis. It doesn't put cartilage back where cartilage is gone. But with arthritis, there are days that the thumb hurts more and days it hurts less. And it's not because there's more or less cartilage on the good and bad days. It's because there's more inflammation on the bad days. And so the cortisone works by getting rid of or tampening down the inflammatory response of the cells that line the arthritic joint. And so by doing that, some patients, particularly with more mild to moderate disease, can get months and months of relief. And so I have some people that come in every six to nine months for a cortisone injection for the base of their thumb arthritis. A lot of people hear from other doctors that they can only have a certain number of injections in their lifetime at a certain spot. And we already talked about with trigger finger, I don't recommend more than two injections. But for base of thumb arthritis, it's such a small joint and there's such a small amount of uh, uh, cortisone that I put in there that I tell people, if you get at least six to nine months of relief and your joint is already pretty destroyed from the arthritis, there's really no downside of giving you another cortisone injection if we're keeping you out of the operating room. But at some point, the pain from bone grinding on bone is more of a component of pain than the pain from the inflammatory spikes of the arthritis. So the bad days are just more common than the good days. And in those cases, the cortisone just doesn't provide much sustained relief at all. And in those cases, we consider surgery for this. And I will tell you that these are some of my happiest patients because the surgery for base of thumb arthritis does work really, really well to give you a thumb that doesn't hurt when you pinch and grip and open a water bottle. So this is that picture I showed you earlier where you can see the arthritis. And essentially the way the surgery works is to remove the arthritic area here so that there's no bone touching bone anymore. And in my hands, I do this through an outpatient surgical procedure, meaning you come and go the same day. We typically do it with a regional nerve block for anesthesia. So the anesthesiologist will numb up the arm and give the patient some twilight anesthesia. So they take a nap and they wake up and it's done, but they don't need a general anesthetic. I make a small incision at the base of the thumb and through that same incision, I remove the arthritic area. And then I take the tendon that inserts right here at the base of the thumb. And that typically is the deforming force with the arthritis that wants to pull this thumb out of position. And I take one portion of that tendon like a sling and I wrap it around here to stabilize this thumb so it doesn't go and touch this bone, the scaphoid, uh, in the future. And that surgery takes a little less than an hour. You go home with your thumb splinted and I see you back in the office about 10 days after surgery. And at that point, typically I check your wound to make sure everything's healing properly. And then my hand therapist will make you a plastic version of the splint that you will um, uh, wear uh, to, to support the repair for the rest of six weeks. So I tell patients, your thumb's gonna be out of commission for six weeks, but your other fingers, the index through small fingers can be used to type and swipe and do light things. You're just not lifting or gripping anything heavy for the six weeks. After the six weeks of protecting it with that removable splint that's removable for showers and washing your hands, but is otherwise on there to protect the repair, you do a short course of hand therapy to work on your motion and strength. And by three months, when you're done with all formal therapy, most people tell me they have 90 to 95% pain relief. The surgery is really good at getting rid of the pain at the base of the thumb, but you may still feel a little bit of weakness. Interestingly, we've studied this a lot and the strength after surgery is actually better 
than the strength before surgery. But it really does take about a year to fully get there. So it's not like you're doing therapy after that. It's just, I tell people, you'll just notice that the strength will come naturally as you keep using your hand more and more. And so, um, like I said, it's often in both hands. And so typically I, 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 I try to get patients to wait a minimum of three months before both sides, if they wanna get both sides done, because at three months, you're still feeling a little bit weak. Um, but, but classically, if we get you to about six months, you're feeling really, really good in the, in the operative hand enough that it can be your, the, the hand you rely on as you're recovering from the other side. So that is base of thumb arthritis. There are other techniques that are done for this. Some of my colleagues um, do um, a little bit more traditional way where they take a tendon from the forearm through a separate incision and wrap it like an anchovy and put it in here. And so there's other techniques for this as well. In the literature, all of them work. So all of them work, which is wonderful because this is a, a, a condition that is, has very high success rates. Um, and there is no method that's particularly superior to another in, in the literature. Um, so typically I say, let your surgeon do what they are most comfortable with and what they think intuitively makes the most sense. And so I do it this way, the way I mentioned, because I think it addresses uh, the problems of the deformity best. And I like doing it all through one incision. Um, but there's no, no problem if your surgeon has recommended the other way. It's still a very good, good really good technique. Okay. Okay. I think this may be the last condition that I'm going to talk about, and then we will get through some of your questions. So Defrevain syndrome is um, another very common condition that I treat. And essentially it causes pain right here on the outside of the wrist, which is very close to where the base of the thumb arthritis is. And essentially patients point right here to the bump on the, on the outside of the wrist. And it classically occurs in new parents and grandparents who are lifting babies with their thumbs out underneath the armpits. And essentially what happens is you get a lot of inflammation around the tendons that lift your thumb up. And so this picture here is an MRI scan, um, another cross-sectional image for you of the wrist. And this is the radius bone, and this is the ulna bone. And all these dark ovals on the back here are the extensor tendons that lift your thumb and fingers and wrist up, okay? And there's different compartments for them where they're divided by these thick bands of tissue that keep them in separate compartments. And this over here where the red arrow is, is the first dorsal compartment. And these tendons in this first dorsal compartment are the ones that run right through here. And when they get inflamed, classically from using your thumb a lot to kind of pick up children, um, but it can really happen at any time because we use our thumbs all the time, the tendons get inflamed and they just don't fit in that tunnel very well. And so when you do this maneuver where you grab your thumb and you deviate your wrist towards the floor, you pull the tendons through that tunnel and it causes a lot of pain. So that's the classic diagnostic maneuver that your hand surgeon will do in the office to see if that this does reproduce the pain in this scenario. Um, Similar to the other things we've discussed before, there's a lot of treatment options for decor veins. And we classically start with a brace to prevent you from overdoing it with the tendons. I also ask new moms to try to scoop as much as they can rather than using their thumb out underneath the baby's armpit to lift. And again, that topical cream can be helpful to get rid of the inflammation. When symptoms persist, a cortisone injection into the first dorsal compartment there can really get rid of the inflammation around the tendons. And so, um, particularly in the new mom scenario, this can be curative, just like a trigger finger. It gets rid of the inflammation um, with a modification in terms of lifting. It often never comes back and, and we're in a great place. But if the symptoms persist, surgery is something that sometimes is required for decor veins. And you see this fascial band here, which is holding the compartment in place. Through a very small incision on the outside of the wrist, we release that tunnel so that the tendons no longer are squished in there. And if they're swollen and inflamed, they can glide without getting uh, compressed there. Similar to the anesthesia options for trigger finger and carpal tunnel, this can be done with the patient completely awake with just numbing medicine so they can eat and drink and drive themselves home. And again, we do that technique at the Sibley Surgery Center um, or also other procedure suites. Um, and it can be done um, with patients with toilet anesthesia. We take a nap and then you go home. Uh, but either way, we release the compartments so that the tendons are free. And then you go home with a soft bandage that's on for about a week. And then you go back to normal activity. 
usually by about 10 days when I see patients back in the office, they'll, they'll start working on regaining their motion and strength and then go back to activity. And by six weeks, usually you're kind of in a great place where you forget you had surgery. Um, so that would be Decorvain syndrome. So um, thank you very much. Uh, this is my office information. Again, I'm with Summit Orthopedics. And if you have any specific personal questions about conditions that you're currently dealing with, I'd be very happy to see you. Uh, you can call 301-657-9876 to make an appointment. I'm primarily on a New Mexico Avenue, uh, Foxhall Medical Building um, location, which is very close to Sibley, but I also see patients in our Chevy Chase office. And I'm gonna look now at the chat to see if Dr. I can answer. Okay. I, I, yes. I was gonna say, I we had a spammer while you were presenting. So I huh. directed everybody to put everything into the Q&A section. But I do have two questions that did come up in the uh, chat. And if I could, I'll give you those and we'll answer those and then we'll go to the Q&A if we can. Okay. All righty. The first one was, if past hand trauma causes trigger finger, which already has cortisone injections, Dupatrons, and thumb base issues, can both procedures be done at once? Yes. Okay. So it's not uncommon that um, with hand surgery, we address many different issues at the same time. Um, there is such a thing as too much surgery for one hand to be a pleasant experience, but um, base of thumb arthritis and trigger finger, uh, definitely very routinely done at the same time. Um, Dupatrins is a condition I did not talk about today. Dupatrins is a genetic condition where trauma can bring it out, but it can happen in the absence of trauma just because of genetics, um, where you get nodules in your palm and those nodules can turn into rope-like structures, which we call cords that pull the fingers in. And it classically does not cause pain, but it can cause dysfunction because you can end up having trouble with function with your fingers bent. Um, it preferentially affects the outside two fingers of the hand and so, uh, they think one of the initial popes may have had it, hence the Benedictine sign, because it's really, really, really common. Um, but um, surgery can, I, I say poke the bear. So surgery can um, bring out Dupatrin. So can trauma, but surgery is trauma. So if you have a history of Dupatrins and you have a trigger finger and a thumb arthritis surgery done, you may get a flare of your Dupatrins at the same time. Dupatrins typically does not need treatment if you can get your hand flat in the table. And so taking out Dupatrin's tissue is always an option, but doing it without a contracture um, is something that is often not necessarily recommended because it can come back. But the Dupatrin's tissue that's in the region of a trigger finger can definitely be removed when the trigger finger is dealt with, along with the base of the thumb arthritis. So hopefully that answers the question. Okie dokie. And then we have, do you have suggestions for pain at the bottom of the hand opposite the thumb. It feels as though the tendons have gotten tangled in some way and it results in pain and weakness. My GP suggests bone spurs. Thanks. So with that description alone, it's hard to know exactly what's going on. Um, definitely you can get arthritis on the other side of the hand. In addition to base of the thumb, you can have arthritis on the other side. But you can also get some um, subluxation of the tendons where they kind of pop back and forth because of some lack of um, robust uh, integrity of the structures on the back of the hand that hold the tendons in place in the right spot. And so uh, for you, I would recommend that you come in so the hand surgeon can, either me or one of my colleagues, uh, can actually take a look at your specific scenario. And classically, what we'll do is check your tendons and also so consider getting an x-ray to look for the possible bone spurs that your primary care mentioned, and we'll be able to see those on x-rays and see if they're, they're implicated. Um, often the, the ulna, which is right up here at the end of the forearm, can get a big bone spur, and that can cause the tendons to kind of rub and scrape over it and it's on the opposite side of the thumb. And that actually can be a pretty serious condition because the tendons can actually rupture from rubbing on there, and you can end up losing the ability to straighten the fingers. So... Um, when in doubt, if there's something going on with your hand, I do recommend that you have a hand surgeon see it just to make sure that it's one of the things that we can watch. Um, most of us are classically fairly conservative at first, um, at least I hope to think so. And so 
um, I recommend getting evaluated and see if um, there's anything that needs to be done or can be done. All righty, next one. What topical gel would you recommend for pain? So Voltaren gel is the one that's been around for a very long time. You can get it on Amazon and at Costco. And it's kind of like topical Advil. Recently, I've seen a lot more uh, advertisements for sort of other versions, other brands that are very similar, but that does work pretty well. And I've used it myself and it works pretty well. There is a prescription strength drug called Pensed, which is a topical cream that I give some patients um, that need a little bit stronger medication than Voltaren, but can't take oral anti-inflammatory medications. And that's a prescription. Not every insurance covers it. Uh, but if it is covered by your insurance, it does work a little bit stronger than the Voltaren gel. And then there are medications that you can get from a compounding pharmacy. Um, I don't classically write these, but my pain management colleagues do. And so if I have somebody who I think needs it, I'll send it to them. And what they'll do is they will cater a specific salve towards a specific problem. So for example, if there's nerve pain and inflammation, they will have the compounding pharmacy mix together some nerve pain medication, along with some anti-inflammatory pain medication, as along with some topical numbing type medicine and make it in one cream. And so the patient can rub on there and, and that can be very effective as well. Okay, uh, what can be done for arthritis of the second joint of the thumb? Okay, so I'm not sure which second joint you're talking about, but probably this joint here, which is the MP joint and the, um, this is the last joint of the thumb. And so arthritis for the MP joint of the thumb, metacarpophalangeal joint of the thumb, is treated um, typically with bracing, gels, injection. And then as a last resort, we actually fuse that joint. So we don't do an arthroplasty typically for that joint. Um, like we do for the base of the thumb, we typically fuse this one. And still very functional without motion at that joint because you have motion at the base and motion at the tip. And so that's classically what we do for that arthritis. Okay. And the last one I have in chat, and then we can go to the Q&A, is can trigger finger go away by just bracing at night for a length of time? Yes. So it depends on how severe the trigger finger is, but often conservative treatment for trigger finger does work, which is why starting with a nighttime brace and some anti-inflammatory cream is always a good idea if it's a very mild presentation. All right, everything else should be in the Q&A. Okay, um, I'm going to read these out loud so people can see. What, when do I release on the tendon from your thumb down to the wrist? I've had two cortisone injections, pain comes back in six months. Do you think, do you, do you do much additional damage by not going forward with surgery? Okay, so this sounds like Decra veins and they've done um, two cortisone injections and the problem has come back. And sometimes that happens when you have an anatomic variant. So instead of one compartment for those tendons, you actually have a separate septum making the compartment even tighter. And in those cases, we classically see failures of injections and bracing. And by failure, I mean recurrent symptoms. I do not recommend ongoing cortisone in those cases, because again, cortisone is not good for the underlying tissue. I have seen that the, the tendons themselves can look very angry and abraded when the problem goes on for a very long time. But I don't typically tell people you're gonna have a lot of additional damage from not going forward with surgery. It's more that the surgical procedure itself is so minor and can lead to such good outcomes with pain relief that um, delaying it just leads to ongoing suffering for um, a very low risk procedure. So I'll tell you that the most common thing I hear from my patients who are hesitant to have surgery and have surgery for this condition is, boy, I wish I'd done it sooner. And while I don't see damage per se, uh, frequently when we don't get to surgery uh, for a very long time, what I do see is a lot of stiffness that makes the recovery very hard to overcome. So yeah. it hurts to do this. And so you stop doing that and you come in with a really stiff wrist. And so we fix the underlying problem that caused the stiff wrist, but those patients often need some prolonged hand therapy afterwards to get their full motion back. And if we'd gotten it to, to it sooner, it's a very quick recovery. 
Okay, what can be done for arthritis of the second joint of the thumb? I think I just talked about that. Um, can you talk about arthritis of the fingers and how to best treat it, including nodules? Okay, so I did not talk about the arthritis of the small little joints of the fingers, and that is worth mentioning for sure. So um, arthritis of the small joints of the fingers classically causes mourning, stiffness, and achiness. So the fingers feel stiff and achy, and it's hard to get them going in the morning. Um, and there can be a lot of pain throughout the day. And so um, typically I recommend the following. So on the most conservative end, I like warm water Epsom salt soap. So you put your hands in some warm water when you wake up in the morning with Epsom salts and it gets them going and it helps with that stiffness and achiness. The hand therapist often can be helpful to guide you through some modalities and lifestyle choices like golf grips, for example, to make it easier to grip your golf clubs. Um, different um, tools around the kitchen to help you with hand arthritis. And we combine that with the modalities to help with pain like the Epsom salt soaks. The creams we talked about like Voltaren gel can be helpful. Um, and then I really like a wrap called Coban, C-O-B-A-N. And you can get the one inch Coban and wrap it around the arthritic joints, particularly the ones that really hurt. And that can be very effective when you're trying to be very functional while still pre preserving motion. If the symptoms progress despite that, we can try cortisone injections. And ultimately, there are very good surgical procedures to fix the arthritis in the small joints of the fingers as well. So for the very last knuckles, the, you know, the joints that are very much at the tip where you get those bony bumps and nodules, um, we actually fuse those because you don't end up with a lot of motion there and, and there's very little functional deficit and we get rid of the pain. We get rid of the deformity by just sticking a screw across the tip there to make you have a straight finger again. For the knuckle that's a little bit um, more here and here, these two knuckles, if they um, are persistently arthritic and painful and we failed conservative treatment with all the things I've mentioned with uh, gels and, and wrapping and, and um, modalities and injections, we actually can do knuckle replacements for these knuckles, these and these knuckles. And the knuckle replacements are an outpatient surgical procedure where we remove the arthritic area and we replace them with a spacer that allows you to open and close your fingers and preserves motion, but takes away pain. And people really do very well with them. It's obviously the last resort. We always start with a conservative approach and move forward, but there are things that we can do for hand arthritis. And a lot of people think, oh, hand arthritis, there's nothing we can do. And the answer is, there's a lot we can do. So it'd be worthwhile to see your hand surgeon if it's bothering you. Um, okay, I'm getting the bones at the base of my thumb are fused. How much of a complication is this for surgery for basic thumb arthritis? Um, I would need to see an x-ray there to make a decision about whether you would be a candidate for that. Um, and so that's something that I would recommend coming in the office for an x-ray so we can evaluate that further. Okay, um, I see a, a question about success rate for arthritis in the fingers for the index finger rather than the thumb and the risks involved in the surgery. So um, the success rate is very high for arthritis in the fingers and the index finger is one of them. Um, and by success, I mean dramatic improvements in pain while preserving function and motion. And so I typically tell people, if you think about your thumb or your finger or your index finger or your middle finger, whichever finger it is, on more days than you don't, and the conservative things that we've tried are, are not providing sustained relief, it's probably time to consider surgery. But as to your second question, there are absolutely risks with surgery and there are risks with every surgery. But in this case, the risks of surgery are far outweighed by the benefits, otherwise we would not we would not consider recommending it. The risks of the surgery for arthritis of the index finger, and, and specifically in this case, I'm imagining we're talking about a knuckle replacement and not a fusion, are the same as every surgery, which is bleeding, very minuscule risk. We do it with a tourniquet and the blood loss is very small. Infection, infection is always a risk with every surgery, but everything's done sterilely. We give a dose of antibiotics before surgery to minimize that risk, and the risk of infection in the hand surgery is less than 1%, very low. Damage to surrounding structures is a risk with any surgery, but in this case, again, very, very rare, particularly if you go to somebody who does this a lot. 
And then um, ongoing symptoms and need for further treatment are the other things I say. And particularly with this, the implant we put in, I, I like the ones that are actually made out of silicone. And they have a really good long-term track record in the hand because we've used them for years and years and years for patients with bad arthritis, like rheumatoid arthritis. And these implants can wear out over time or break. And if that happens, it's not a huge endeavor to just take them out and put a new one in. And so that's why I favor the silicone ones over the metal and plastic ones, which can dislocate. And so um, the silicone ones, there is a risk that they will break or um, um, pop out of position over time. If that ha happens, we just remove it and put a new implant in. Um, but most people who get this done over the age of 60 per se, um, the implant's designed to last the rest of your life. Um, you know, we don't recommend you do power tool work and things like that afterwards. You want to be kind to your hands so it lasts forever. But most people get really good function back, really good pain relief with very minimal risk. And again, that surgery is also done with what's called a regional nerve block. So the risks of anesthesia are, are quite low. All right. We have another tendon outside the thumb wrist with two shots with pain back. That's the same thing we talked, the Decor veins. And that patient, I would strongly recommend considering surgery because it's um, a pretty, pretty straightforward surgery with a really high risk reward ratio. Um, I have a patient who asked about thumbs rolling inward towards the palms, and that could be the similar deformity from the arthritis. Uh, and often it does cause trouble when you're trying to get your hand flat to do a plank position. Um, in that case, though, it's difficult to tell what you're describing over a chat, so I would recommend coming in for a hand surgery evaluation. Um, this is a good question about whether procedures are contraindicated with Ehlers-Danlos or other connected tissue disorders. And so Ehlers-Danlos is a condition where um, the collagen, uh, which is what kind of gives our, our soft tissues um, good uh, uh, strength, um, tends to be a little bit more stretchy. So they have a lot of hypermobility and um, certain procedures like the fusion procedures that we discussed are definitely fine for Ehlers Danlos. Um, releases like carpal tunnel is definitely fine for Ehlers Danlos. Um, the thumb arthritis procedure, there would theoretically be a little higher risk of stretching out those repairs. Um, and in general, everything is slightly more complicated with Ehlers Danlos than without Ehlers Danlos, but um, I wouldn't say it's contraindicated per se, depending on how bad the pain is. Okay. Okay, spell the name of the gel. Sorry, I may have skipped a few things here. Um, the gel is V-O-L-T-A-R-E-N, Voltaren. Um, what is my opinion of CBD creams? I find that, that many patients get really good relief from them and it is worth a try. Um, I don't prescribe it myself, but I do know people have been able to go get it and I have several patients who have had good relief with it. And then I see is the webinar recorded so you can watch it again. And the answer is yes, it is recorded. And Kathy, who has very graciously and wonderfully put this whole thing together, I believe will be able to distribute the recording. Kathy, Kathy can you unmute and explain how that works? But I think you said you're gonna send out something about that. I can. Uh, if you send me an email and I will put my email in the Q&A section, uh, I will send you the recording. What happens is it goes through a process of um, being, we'll say cleaned up or just to make sure it's okay. And then uh, I get it, it's available to me in about a week and then I can send it out to anybody who would like it. Okay, so Kathy's gonna put her email in the chat and if you email her, she will send you the recording. I see I missed one question because of my scrolling and it's my trigger finger is severely swollen, has been for months. Is this something I should have treated immediately? Extremely painful. And the answer is, it may be something other than a trigger finger. It could be a trigger finger. It can cause swelling and pain, but there's other reasons for severe swelling and pain, such as infection. And so I would recommend having that finger checked out. Um, I wouldn't necessarily tell you that it has to be treated immediately until we know what exactly is the cause, 
but I do recommend getting it checked out sooner rather than later if it's extremely swollen and painful because that's something where even if it is treated, it can take a long time to get the motion back after it's been restricted for months with swelling and pain. And because I'm hosting also, it won't let me ask a question. So if I can give everybody my email address while we're on the, on the uh, webinar, my email is C, P as in Paul, U L F O R 1 at J H M I dot E D U. And I just put that in the answer. Thank Hopefully you. It went to everybody. Thank you, Dr. Kate. Um, so hopefully everybody sees this, but I'm not sure. Maybe it didn't. Got it again. Because I can't tell if it just went to you about the spanner or not. Um, let me see if I can. Well, can I put it in the chat, even though the chat was spammed? I'm going to put it there, too. I was going to say I blocked the chat. OK, well, I put it in the chat in case anyone can access that either. Anyway. OK, then let me unblock the chat and <laughs> uh, everybody can can view it there uh, again. OK, does anyone? Uh, well, I guess what I will say is thank you so much for joining us. It is six. Uh, it's seven o'clock. And so it's pretty much the end of our session. Um, and um, if anybody um, uh, has any specific issues with their hands, again, I'd be thrilled to see you all in my office. Um, my phone number is 301-657-9876, and that is the central scheduling that can book for um, both me and uh, my partner, Dr. Hawk, who's another hand surgeon. Um, and uh, Kathy, thank you again so much, and thank you to Sibley and the Gildehorn Institute. Have a good night, everyone.